Okay, guys, um, I've got some bad news and some good news. Uh, the bad news I'll start with first, I am battling a horrific migraine right now. So if I seem a little bit off step, uh, please give me grace and mercy. I'm much more than that. I'm going to ask you to pray for healing. Um, the good news is I plan on not at all one time talking about Will Smith or Chris Rock. Other than to say, Rock should have just clocked that guy and gone, gone full-blown fisticuffs. I'm, that's, it, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> okay, let's just jump right into it. We want to leave sufficient time for uh, taking communion together at the end. I'm going to give you a little bit of, of background on where we've been. We rounded a really interesting and fun corner last week in, in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 6, 1 through 4 is what we went over. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, what we saw this morning, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Last week, we started tackling this persistently problematic question that has been in Christendom forever. It goes a little something like this. How deep is the grace of Jesus? How all-encompassing is his forgiveness for us? The greater context that that is asked in, if we're honest with ourselves, is how much can I really get away with if I'm forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ? How, how, how much of a lifestyle change is required of me if I have become a follower of Jesus Christ? Um, our responses to that can be kind of funky, right? Well, we talked last week about a, a swing to this side of the pendulum, antinomianism, which is, okay, if the grace of Jesus Christ is so abundant and so about, we get to do whatever we want, Antinomianism means no law, literally no requirements, no law, no checklists, no nothing. And then the religious people swing all the way over to this side where we go, well, I'm really nervous about this whole grace abusal thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take God's laws, which are, you know, yeah, undeniable. They're there, they're clear, they're written in stone. But I'm going to add my own laws onto them as well to make sure that we don't have grace abusers, and we get downright silly about those things. Remember we opened up the floor to, to talk about that last week, and some of the, the churchy weird requirements are like no dancing, you know, because God doesn't like rhythm for some reason, I guess. Uh, no rated R movies unless they're about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and then we're confused. Uh, no drinking, no smoking, no tattoos. All of these things, well, whether or not you agree with them or not, we have to admit that our pendulum swings over to the other side of in order to not get grace abusers, let's build structures around behavior. And what we started talking about last week in the verses that we just read is that Paul's response to that is you're missing the point. The point is this, if you are in relationship with Jesus, you will change. If you are in relationship with Jesus, you will change. On the screen, the, my main quote from last week, the primary motivation for Christian holiness is not fear of what God is going to do to me, but love because of what God has done for me. Read it again. The primary motivation for Christian holiness is not fear of what God is going to do to me, but love because of what God has done for me. We ended last week with talking about the fact that we are forgiven and cleansed if we have encountered the blood of Jesus Christ. And why those two things are important is forgiveness is, by very nature, the salvation. But then cleansed is the power to walk in newness of life. We are forgiven and then cleansed. I read it this way. Paul's main point in this passage is this. We don't want to abuse God's grace once we have the relationship, but we want to use God's grace so we can have the relationship. I should have put that one on the screen. That's a good one. I'll read it again. We don't want to abuse God's grace once we have the relationship with him, but we want to use God's grace so we can have the relationship. 
the question that needs to be answered in every life that God has given this world. What am I going to do with Jesus? And if I want to step into a relationship with Jesus, is there evidence of the fact that I've done that? The evidence is not a list of rules. The evidence is not, check this box, check this box, you're good to go. The evidence is, are you growing? Do you have a desire to change? So we're going to jump into this passage a little bit more today. And I'm going to pray over us, because this, this has historically been a very difficult lesson to absorb for Christianity, for just evangelicalism across the board. Like, we have a hard time really reconciling where we land on this requirement thing when it comes to holiness. Listen, we've disagreed about this so much that there have been denominations formed around our interpretations of these verses. Denominations that we cannot agree with one another, and I believe it's a whole lot more simple than what we make it. I believe that this is actually a a beautifully empowering lesson if we can grasp it. Because I'm going to say it again, we need the grace of God in this place. I need the grace of God to be able to live the life that I'm supposed to live. I cannot white-knuckle behavior modification hard enough to be good enough. I will fail immediately. But if I grasp the fact that I live under the grace that empowers me, then all bets are off. Then change has occurred. Then I get to walk in the newness that the Word of God just promised me. So let me pray over us. God, I ask right now for a deep opening up of our spirits today. I ask God, let me be selfish right out of the gate. I need you to touch my head. God, I need you to help me get this deep and nuanced point across, God, in a way that's, that's digestible and understandable. And God, I feel like I'm getting pushed back in the spirit and the physical as well. So God, step in and let your voice be heard through me today. And then God, I pray that you would open up our hearts, Jesus. Maybe there are people in this room right now that you want to set free into a life of power now. Into a life of finally being clicked in with this equation that gives them the audacity to believe that they can put sin to death. God, I pray that that gets revealed in these next few minutes, God. Holy Spirit, have your way. Speak to us through your word, through your revelation. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Romans 6, 5 through 11. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's awesome news. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Okay. Why are we not bouncing off the walls right now? Now, I know it's a little bit awkward in the room right now. Like, pastor's admitted that he's got a bad headache. We're kind of nervous for him. Let it go, all right? If I mess up my words, I mess up my words. We are talking about the truth of Jesus Christ. Why are we not bouncing off the walls right now? Okay, do you realize what this Bible just said to us? Do you realize it just said, listen, your old man, gone, done, dead. Not only that, you get to live in the power of Jesus Christ. The Word of God also tells us that. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me now. Everything is under my feet. Everything is under my feet. There's nothing... There is nothing that drags down the believer in Jesus Christ that grasps this concept. Nothing. And I get to talk to you about that for the next few minutes. I love this. Um, I read this this week as well. That there's this kind of analogy I want to bring to you about Lazarus. You guys know Lazarus, the story of Lazarus? That great Carmen song from the 80s, Lazarus, come forth. Church guys, you know what I'm talking about? He was a friend of Jesus's. And he dies. He gets sick and he dies. And his story encapsulates the 
the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. This caused Jesus pain and sorrow. And Jesus goes to him, and he calls into the grave. He'd been dead for days. And he calls into the grave, Lazarus, come forth. He spoke life into the corpse, and Lazarus comes jumping out. Now, I just want you to picture that scene for a second, would you? The, the, like, um, the mummification process, they didn't quite go through embalming and everything like that, but when they wrapped up a body, they wrapped up a body, okay? Jesus spoke life into this dead thing. He was immediately transformed from death to life, comes hopping out of the grave, and he's alive with grave clothes on him. I think that's a, a cool little analogy of salvation. We are made alive, we are made new, we are made perfect, but a lot of us walk around with grave clothes on us. The way that these, these clothes would have been bound up on him is he would have needed help to get free of looking dead. Was he dead? No. Was, I mean, remember the song, Jesus? I think I hear him call me now. We've got to play that song next week. Um, he was made alive, immediately alive. But to look at him, he still had the semblance of death. The King James says he is described as this. Lord, he stinketh. That means he's really dead. He's gone. His body started the decaying process already. He's gone. Jesus speaks life to dead things. They become alive now. And they need to get rid of the grave clothes. That's, that's what this is pointing to here. These, these few verses that we're reading, some of the, out of the last chapter of Romans. Um, I, I read this week also that there was a, a pastor that, that he's been preaching for 20, he says it this way, in 25 years of Bible teaching, let me give you the points from these passages that you need to grasp, and I want to speak to you the power of your salvation. This man is saying that in these passages, in Romans 6, there are things, declarations that you need to understand have been said over you. And first of all, he jumps back into Romans 5. Through one man, death entered the world. Through one man, life entered the world. He says, first declaration, your old self joined Adam in death. Your new self joins Jesus in new life. This must be accepted about salvation. We can see the first part of that equation very easily. I can see the busted things in me. I can see the dead things in me. I see the broken things in me. But... If one man entered into man's timeline, sin, brokenness, and separation from God, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, entered in salvation, perfection, and holiness. We have joined with both of those. We're born joined with this one. Through our second birth, huh? born again into this one. Our old man was dead. Our new man is alive in Jesus Christ. Number two, you are set free from sin and set free to God. Set free from sin and set free to God. Okay, the, the verbiage used here are agrarian terms. When Paul writes about you're grafted into the vine of Jesus Christ, what he's meaning there, and these agrarians listening to him back in this day would understand, there's a, a dead branch, a dead root here that is presented with a newness the power, the life, the vitality of Jesus Christ. How do you redeem that dead thing into the new thing? You cut it open, you splice it together, you're grafted in. You're grafted in. And you're not set free just to wallow in brokenness and sin. You literally have to understand that the, the life of Jesus Christ that is coursing through the veins of Jesus Christ is the shoot that you are grafted into. Listen, what I'm trying to say, you're going to hear me repeat it a lot. There's no sin that gets to trump that. There's no defeat that gets to trump that. There's no discouragement or anxiety that gets to trump that. You're new. You might have been dead before, but you're grafted in. And I think the enemy has done a profoundly good job of tricking the church into being, oh, well, this is just the way I've always been. Can't get victory. The Jesus Christ died. Your sin died. Jesus Christ lives. Your victory lives. 
That's all there is to it. I should preach with migraines more often. Number three, you are not perfect, but you are new, and you will be perfect. You are not perfect, but you are new, and you will be made perfect. Here's what I know about this process. Jesus ain't going to stop with you until you're perfected. Yeah, he is faithful and he is just to complete that which he started. You're not perfect yet, but you are new. And Jeff, this is what I was talking about when you were up here earlier. I, I've got a handful of guys in my life that I'm walking closely next to. I'm meeting with on a regular basis. And I, I, I mean, there's different levels of brokenness across the board. You know, I represent that broken spectrum too. And I can see in all of these lives the evidence of newness, the evidence of change, of growth. Are any of them perfect? Is your pastor perfect? Absolutely not. But we are being perfected. You can bank on that because of what we just read in Romans chapter 6. Number four, and this is a three-parter here, and it's probably the most important point of his little outline. He describes God's grace in these passages. And he says, God's grace does three things for you. It forgives you, it changes your nature, and it changes your desires. I love that this man took these passages, these verses, and pointed this out, because that is exactly what it is saying. The grace of Jesus Christ forgives you, changes your nature, and therefore changes your desires. And we get, we get hung up on every point of that spectrum. Okay, I recognize that. But let me just kind of address them one by one. If Jesus has forgiven you, you are not a greater authority that would say, no, I can't, he can't touch that. He can't. Listen, the God of the universe, the maker of all things, this Yahweh God, his son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that fills us, that we literally have an incapability of describing down to the fibers of his DNA. He is that powerful. He is that glorious. He is that God. He has looked at you and said, Bruce, forgive me. Bruce doesn't get up to God and say, I disagree. I, no, it's good enough for Ken, okay? But I'm, I, I got this. I got whatever this is. I, you are not a higher authority than God is. The sooner you can just say, you know what, I'm going to stop disagreeing with the Almighty, the better your life's going to be. Trust me. Trust me. You are forgiven. If Christ has set you free, you are free indeed. Stop trying to put those grave clothes back on you, brother or sister. Secondly, he changes your nature. It, he takes the heart of stone, Ezekiel says, and gives us a heart of flesh. And here, here's the flow of this that you must understand. In the changing of nature, it always goes inside first and then out. We, we've got it backwards. We try to make the outside all perfect and clean and come into churches and pretend to put on nicer clothes than we usually wear and say words we don't say during the week and we're just trying to make the outside look shiny. That's not the point. Your outside will get a bit more shiny, but it's because of a nature change inside you. Okay? This is, this is where it comes. It comes from the inside out. That's the flow. That's why works-based salvation is absolutely ludicrous. It can't work. You're never going to be good enough. But God says, because I'm good. I shed my blood for you. Now be changed. Be changed. Be changed. And then lastly, he says he changes our desires. I'm going to be pretty transparent with you and a bit vulnerable right now. And uh, call it the, the headache. We, we go with that. If this is a bit over the line, my wife will tell me. Um, in my early to mid-20s, I made a lot of poor choices in relationships. I, I mistreated a lot of people. And I damaged myself profoundly. And then I reconciled who God made me to be with the man that I was. And I determined some things about my future. From the grace that I had received, because of the work that God had done in my life, I determined how I was going to move forward. My wife and I dated in college, didn't work out at the point, and then God kind of reunited our paths six years after graduation. And uh, the man that I was the first time we dated uh, was that bad guy, that, that guy that kind of playing some games, and I, I didn't 
mistreat her and, and the respects that I'm talking about, but I, I sure desired to. A little bit too vulnerable, a little bit too real. I'm talking about sex. <laughs> Just so we're clear. Okay. When God did this, oh, somebody got it. <laughs> Stop being so cryptic, Ken. What do you mean? <laughs> when God brought her back into my life, I still remember sitting down with her. She was living with her parents in Orlando, so I was flying there every two months or so, wasting a lot of money. Not wasting, investing, investing. <laughs> Headache, medication. Um, I remember sitting her down and saying to her, sweetheart, I want you to understand something about how we're going to move forward here. I will guard you. I will guard your honor. I will guard the purity of this relationship. You can trust me. I believe that scripturally, it is the man's responsibility to protect the woman that God brings him. I know that sounds patriarchal, but deal with it. It's not going away. All right? I believe in the Song of Psalms, uh, the Song of Songs, rather, there is an interaction between the man and the woman in the story. And the woman, before the marriage has taken place, because she's falling in love with this man, she trusts him, she loves him, she says something to the extent of, you know, come into your garden. That's pretty risque, all right? But she's, she's inviting this man in. And he said, Dear sister, do not arouse or awaken passion before it is time. That tells me it's our responsibility, boys. It is our responsibility. And what does our culture say? Our culture, our culture says, get away with whatever she'll let you get away with. Hey, even more than that, manipulate her into giving you things she doesn't want to give you. That's what a man does. I had learned this lesson hard. And when I sat my bride to be down, I said, wherever God is taking this relationship, Christine, whatever his plan is for us in the future, and I believe it's going to be together, but even if it's not, you can trust me to not betray your honor. You can trust me to be a man of God that says, I'm not going to defraud you in this way. I've got this, and I did. You want to know where that came from? A change of nature that brought about a change of desires. Because if you would have rewound that, Ken, six, seven years previous, you would not have seen a man that would have said those words with conviction to a woman. You would not. But I'm telling you, in that moment, because my old nature had been surrendered to Jesus Christ, I truly, and I mean this with all my heart, I truly desired to be a man of God with my future wife. I truly desired Jesus. This, I want this more than I want this. And in that grace, in that desire change, I've found the power to not be the old man. Okay? I mean, I haven't said it this way. I was like, headache. Um, I said, even if you beg to me, Christine, I'm going to walk upstairs to your parents and I'm going to knock on your dad's door and say, Al, I need help with your daughter. <laughs> that was my true desire. Too far? Too far. <laughs> I desired the flow of God in what was to be the most important relationship in my life. On the screens, the Christian life is not what you have to do. It is what you get to do because it is what you want to do. The Christian life is not what you have to do. It's what you get to do because it's what you want to do. I'll tell you this much. When I was a sinner, my inmost desires were for sin. Now that I'm redeemed, my inmost desires are for Jesus. And I, I really mean that. I'm not trying to prop myself up as guys got it all perfect and all down, okay? Please don't think that of anybody in this room. But I'm telling you and looking at my heart, my deepest desires, they're for him. Now I'm going to tell you a little something. I think I've said something like this from this pulpit before too, but um, we're not numerologists, but Christine and I a few years ago started noticing we're seeing 77s everywhere. And we started asking God for that, like in phone numbers or license plates, things like that. Just, God, are you saying something here? I don't know, a lot of you are like, oh, this guy's a kook. No, we're not going to give, well, I'm not going to tell you when the rapture is going to take place, okay? <laughs> um, but we just leaned into it, and, uh, and actually, we believe the Holy Spirit kind of revealed to us through a sermon that my baby sister preached for Mother's Day when she talked about Matthew 7, 7, ask, seek, and knock. 
And so I, I just took that as, I believe God is asking us to lean into him and ask when we see these things. So when I'm driving around and I, I see three cars in a row that have 77s in the license plate, and I believe that God is saying, let's talk, ask, you want to know what I'm asking for? A million dollars to be able to drive a Corvette again one day, to not lose my hair. I'm asking for revival. And I mean that from the depth of my being. I'm asking that God makes himself glorious in his church again. I want to be near his presence. I want to hear him. I want to feel him. And I want to know that he's pleased with us. And I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That is my deepest desire. When I see my 77s, it is no longer God, gimme, gimme, gimme. It is God, give me you. Give me you. And that has come about because of the grace of Jesus Christ on my life. The other thing we need to understand about what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through Paul in these passages is that because Jesus died for your sin, you can put sin to death. I said it already, but I'm going to say it again. Because Jesus died. That death that we witnessed through the story of the crucifixion was not just the death of Jesus. It was the death of your sin. Do you understand that? When we watch the rated R movie, we're permitted to watch and see Jim Caviezel get put into the ground, right? That is not just the death of Jesus Christ. That's the death of your old man. That's the death of this carnality. Number six, because you are changed by him, you can change. Because you are changed, it is inside out, not outside in. Because Jesus has called you new, you have the power to now become new. Because Jesus now lives, you can live with and for him. We talked about this last week, that you are joined to Jesus in the newness of life. Number eight, kind of goes back to number two a little bit. But he says, in this life you will not be perfect, but you will make progress. Um, I want us to be a church that celebrates that. And this is where religion gets it wrong a lot of times is what we do is if we don't encourage progress enough, we demand perfection. The only thing that that does in any community of faith is breed hypocrisy. Because we're not going to get there. That's already been established. Heck, just look at yourself in the mirror. You know that's not gonna, you're not going to wake up perfect tomorrow. But you'll wake up better, and be better the day after that. And even if you take a step or two back, you'll be better again, and better again, and better again. We need to celebrate progress and never demand perfection. I remember, uh, it's been a while now, uh, laying in my bed, and Christine was downstairs teaching piano, and I had the, the babies up with us, and they're right around that starting to walk phase uh, that just made my relaxation completely different, right? I mean, there's a progressive baby proofing of the house over and over and over. Uh, this was the beginning of it. I'm laying in bed, and they're playing around on the floor, and from my vantage point, I'm laying there, and I can just kind of, kind of barely see where Olivia, my daughter's head, would be. And she'd started doing this, uh, this like, you know, crawling up on walls and like moving along the bed or the dresser or something like that. And she, I, I swear she planned this. Like I'm laying there, I'm watching her climb up the wall and she's looking at me with this big smile on her face. And she lets go of the wall and teeters toward the bed and takes two steps and falls down. I, my joy knew no bounds. I jumped up like, Olivia, yes, what's well, amazing. It would be a wicked father to look at that precious little baby girl starting to walk and say, what's wrong with you? Two steps? Come on. I walk all day. Your mom walks all day. If I give the dog a treat, she'll walk on her hind legs. What's wrong with you? This is how God sees us. This is how God sees us. He doesn't look at you and compare you to Mother Teresa. He looks at you and he celebrates your progress. Keep going. We will celebrate progress and never demand perfection around here. You are not saved by your good works, but you are saved to do good works. Number 10 might be my favorite one. A sinning Christian is a miserable person. Been there? I certainly have. And it's true. What I'm, what I'm trying to point out to you is this is evidence of the salvation of Jesus Christ being in your heart. Um, you don't like to do the things that you used to really like to do. 
Maybe, maybe you try to dabble in it, but it just vexes you. This is evidence that the grace of Jesus Christ has come into your life. A sinning Christian will always be a miserable Christian. You should just give that up. Your relationship with God is what matters most to you, is the point that he ends on. Um, one of the things that I love about working for a church is the ability to be near this room often. And even very recently, I remember coming in here and I was, you know, nothing big going on in my life, but just like really desiring to be with the Holy Spirit. And I walked in here and I just had those, the, the words of the Carrie Job song, The More I Seek You, going through my head. The more I seek you, the more I find you. I want to sit at your feet and drink the cup from your hands. I want to lay back against you and breathe and feel your heartbeat. If you have these desires inside of you, the Holy Spirit of God is contending with you. That is evidence that Jesus Christ has made you new. And so many of you out there are saying, I, I, I think I can relate to that. What I'm telling you is right now, because of what we just read in, in Romans, that this is the Holy Spirit of God saying, lean into it. Lean into it. Have you guys ever had that desire to just be near God? I just, I just want to, I just want to feel Him. I just want to be close to Him. I want to hear His voice. This is the grace of God. Don't tell me that you can't overcome your sin if you have that emotion. Don't tell me that well, this is just the way I'm always going to be. Ken, can't do it. Don't tell me that. God has made you new. He's changing your nature. He is changing your desires. The last part of that chapter, Romans 6, 12 through 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Listen, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but you are under grace sin will have no dominion over you why because you're already forgiven that's the point this is never about lists of rules this is never about having sufficient enough evidence of salvation this is saying fight from a position of grace and everything is under your feet. Now you're sitting out there and you're, you're wondering, well, there is things I've been struggling with for years. and I'm, Keep going. Keep going. Because your victory hasn't happened yet does not mean it's not on its way. It is. Keep going. This passage tells you it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. You're going to have to choose certain things. What this is saying is you choose for a position of grace. Taking God up on his promises. God... If you said, when I step into covenant relationship with you, I get your power. I need it applied here. I need change here. And watch what he'll do. Watch what he'll do. It may be a process. It probably will be a process. But if you keep leaning into that promise, victory is assured, brothers and sisters. Victory is assured because he died. You can live new with him. That's all there is to it. Sin will try to grapple for you. There will be a fight. Huh. He's trying to get you to see that the victory has already been won. And you're going to have to strap on your sword to get it. Somebody in this room needs to hear that right now. Somebody in this room needs to hear, maybe you're teetering on the brink of that. You know what? I give up. I give up. This thing has been a giant in my life for so long. This, this tendency, this proclivity, this desire, this yearning, this going back to the trough over and over and over again. And you're, you're right at that breaking point of saying, this is my identity. This, this is who I am. I'm this. And Jesus is saying, that's who you used to be. I've made you new. Take off the grave clothes. That's who you used to be. And make the deliberate effort to present your body from a position of grace to the will of Jesus Christ. So let's just, as we close here, let's think about the different members of our body, the different things that the Apostle Paul was talking about in presenting yourself to God and not to sin. Some of the things I was thinking about is, 
God, here's my mind. Here's my mind. I present my mind to you. And I'm asking you to make it holy. Renew my mind. Renew my mind in a way that overtakes me, Jesus. Take these hands, these hands that are so prone to to do wicked deeds and bring harm. Take these hands and make them instruments of blessing, of kindness, of love. Jesus, take these feet. Let them not lead me into wicked places, but keep me far from them and bring me into your presence. Take these feet, take these eyes. God, these eyes that are so prone to look at things that I know I shouldn't be seeing. I want to look with earnest intent on holy things. Keep me pure. Take this mouth, God, this mouth that is so acerbic at times, that speaks curses rather than blessings. I present these things to you, Jesus, and I ask you to make them holy because that is the trough I'm going to now. It's not one of sin and brokenness, but one of holiness, perfection, and virtue. Jesus, help us understand here today, God, that this is a victory that's already been won, and we have no business being trounced by sin anymore, because we, what you've said, you've put inside of me. I'm going to invite the people that are going to hand out communion. Let's come over here and start passing those out. We're going to end like we usually do around here. You can stay seated for this portion. The worship team is going to lead us in one song as they pass out the elements of communion. And then I'm going to come back up at the end and we'll partake together. As they're doing that, dear brothers and sisters, let me speak the benediction over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May you truly embrace the fact that God has forgiven you, period. May you see the battles that still rage within you through the lens of the victory of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. May you plug into the power source of the Holy Spirit as your nature and your desires are being changed. May you present the members of your body to the purposes and function of the Lord Jesus and see your destiny lived out in a way that blows your mind. May sin never have dominion over you, dear child, because you live under grace. Amen.